welcome to our Asteroid Day 2020 digital panel on Seeing is Believing, the Art of Asteroid Computer Simulations. When the first asteroids were discovered in the early 19th century, they appeared as nothing more than points of light, no matter how big the telescope. And that's why in 1802, the astronomer William Herschel proposed the name asteroid to describe these objects. Asteroid meaning star-like. Well, we've come a long way in two centuries. Thanks to better telescopes, we now know that asteroids look less like stars and more like space mountains or even mini planets. And thanks to computers, we now know a lot more about what asteroids do and where they're going. One of the key modern techniques that computers have enabled is data visualization. As the name suggests, it takes numerical information and presents it in a visual context. And that's what today's panel is here to talk about. I'm Alan Boyle, Aerospace and Science Editor for GeekWire. And joining me to talk about how we bring these computer simulations to life are Dr. Yun Zhang, a planetary scientist at the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur. Dr. Mark Boslow, who is a physicist at Los Alamos and the University of New Mexico, and also chair of the Asteroid Day expert panel. Dr. Ronald Baluz, an astrophysicist from the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. And Dr. Daniela Della Giustina, who's also an astrophysicist from the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. Mark, I'd like you to start us off today uh, because we're going to be looking at some pretty pictures, great visualizations, but there's also scientific point behind all those pretty pictures. Tell us how this helps us to understand what asteroids are all about. Sure, Alan. I've, I've gotten to work on lots of fun problems. And one of the most fun that I've ever gotten to deal with doesn't obviously have anything to do with asteroids, or at least it didn't when I first started working on it. And so there's this strange and beautiful glass that's uh, found in the southwestern desert of Egypt. And nobody had a, an explanation for it. There was a lot of speculation. Didn't seem like it could be volcanic. Some people suggested it might have been caused by an asteroid. But, but this stuff is not a crystal. It is, it is glass. So it is melted desert sand that cooled off so quickly it didn't have time to crystallize. And there just didn't seem to be an obvious mechanism for that. But one suggestion was that it was an asteroid that didn't hit the ground and form a crater, but it actually exploded in the atmosphere. And that explosion heated up the sand, caused it to form a liquid. That liquid cooled off very fast and formed a glass. And I was able to model that process on supercomputers and I convinced myself, and I think I convinced some others that that was the cause of the Libyan desert glass. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Ewan, I wanted to talk with you about Oumuamua. This is the interstellar asteroid that came through our solar system and uh, created quite a stir. Uh, and so the visualization came up with kind of a strange cigar, cigar shape. Uh, what do visualizations tell us about these strange objects and, and what can we expect to learn as we go forward and find more of these things? Yeah. Oumuamua is actually the first interstellar we have discovered for the whole, whole, whole time. So uh, it showed a very special cigar shape, like you said, and we start to solve its shape problem by using computer simulations. We wonder how, what kind of process may bring up this elongated shape. So we try like collision and also rotational uh, spin up and rotational fission and also the tidal disruption. And then by running all the possibility, we use the computer simulation and then we found out that the tidal disruption is the most plausible way to form such shape. The, this process is like when a small object that fly very closely to a big one and the self-gravity of this small object cannot hold its 
material and will be stretched out then to form a elongated body. And if it comes very close to the, the, the big one is the star and its surface will be also heat, then the material will melt down. Then they will have add a very strong silly, uh, centering bond into this material. So that will help to maintain the stability of this Sega shape. Then that's how we find the uh, Oumuamuma formation. And as we showed in these movies that we found out by using visual data visualization, the final product looks exactly like what we observed for Oumuamuma. Wow, that's thrilling how uh, life imitates computer simulations sometimes. Uh, Ron, uh, you specialize in uh, asteroid collisions and how they give rise to families of asteroids. And I didn't even know that asteroids had families. Uh, how do data visualizations uh, address this scientific topic? Right. Yeah, great. Uh, I'm glad I was able to teach you something new <laughs> through this panel. Um, well, so what we think is that all asteroids are part of collisional families, meaning just like you came from your parents, these asteroids that we see near the Earth came from a parent asteroid that resides in the main belt. Um, and that's essentially where we get all of our near Earth asteroids. Everything that could hit the Earth um, and cause devastation uh, likely once, came, uh, once resided in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And what we do with computer supercomputer simulations is that we um, we basically simulate the collision that creates these asteroid families. So the origin of all these potentially as, uh, hazardous asteroids. Um, and what that can tell us is essentially uh, what the process is of formation, how they gravitationally reaccumulate after uh, being destroyed, as well as where from the parent asteroid do they come from. Do they come from the interior of the parent? Do they come from the exterior? Uh, that in turn will uh, allow us to get a better idea of how the parent asteroid itself has evolved from the beginning of the solar system when they likely formed. Great. Uh, and Daniela, uh, you are really on the firing line right now with the Os OSIRIS-REx mission, which is supposed to visit uh, an asteroid and, and bring back samples from that asteroid and, and do some interesting maneuvers. Uh, tell us how data visualizations help with this mission and what you can expect to see. So data visualization is a really important part of uh, the OSIRIS-REx uh, sample site uh, evaluation. If you can imagine when we are gathering images of the surface of asteroid Bennu, uh, which is the asteroid that we are gathering a sample from uh, in just a, a couple months later this year, um, they don't, they, they come down as single frames um, and we might not have a lot of context uh, for what uh, a single image of just a pile of rocks it means uh, in, in terms of uh, what Bennu's surface is, is giving us clues in regards to its formation of. Um, and so a lot of what I do is bringing uh, these images together and forming uh, mosaics and eventually maps so that we can uh, get a better sense of how the surface is varying across the asteroid uh, and really put these individual postage stamps into context. Um, we also like combining images with other data sets. Uh, so for example, we have um, spectrometers on the OSIRIS-REx mission and those break down light and give us uh, some information about composition um, and being able to look at that compositional data in context with images and combine that uh, is really helpful for assessing uh, what, what the geologic um, uh, processes are on the surface of this asteroid. So a lot of the data visualization that I engage in is you, you can think of it like data fusion. Uh, it's bringing a lot of different pieces of information into one, um, one environment and then figuring out what, uh, what these collectively tell us about the asteroid. Were you surprised when the visualization came together or was it pretty much what you expected? 
When we first arrived at Asteroid Bennu, I would say the OSIRIS-REx team, including myself, was pretty surprised um, that the surface of the asteroid is as rocky uh, as it was. And uh, certainly bringing together, as, as we've been surveying Bennu over the course of the past year and a half, um, bringing together all these different pieces of data and looking at them in a holistic visual environment uh, has, has revealed some surprises. Um, so it's, it's been just a, a fantastic way to, uh, to interpret uh, a remnant of the formation of the solar system. Great. I suppose uh, one of the ways that the public knows uh, the most about asteroids is through movies. Uh, there were there were a couple of famous disaster movies, Armageddon and Deep Impact, that that uh, visualized it. And I'm sure you experts would have something to say about those visualizations. Uh, does Hollywood come close to the mark, or or are there particularly good examples or bad examples? Mark, I know you've got some examples in mind already. Well, yeah, so I, I watched those uh, movies, Deep Impact and uh, Armageddon, and I, I think they left a little bit to be desired. Well, for one thing, those were giant, giant asteroids that in at least one case was way bigger beyond the, way beyond the size of anything that could possibly hit the Earth. Um, but we are worried in the uh, planetary defense community about the possibility of an impact. Now, we've we know that the craters on the moon are impact craters. We know that there are a lot of craters like Meteor Crater, Arizona, uh, that were formed by an impact on the Earth. But, but we've also known for a long time that very small asteroids can explode in the at atmosphere without hitting the ground. Um, they, they create a, a shock wave. And at Tunguska, the shock wave blew down trees for many square miles. Um, and we've tried to understand that. So one of the uh, ideas for the formation of Libyan desert glass, the stuff in uh, southwestern Egypt, is that it was a Tunguska-like explosion, um, but the asteroid vapor, the vaporized asteroid, very hot, thousands of degrees, white hot, came down and interacted with the surface like a blowtorch and melted the surface and blew it and then rose away from the surface. And that allowed it to cool very quickly and turn to glass. Um, everything we really knew about air bursts prior to being able to use high performance computers to simulate them was based on atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons. And so I did a couple of simulations to compare what would happen if there was just an explosion in the sky, like a nuclear explosion, and, and we understand the physics very well, it creates a very hot bubble of gas. That bubble is like a sphere, like a hot air balloon, and it rises from buoyancy. So it actually moves the very hot debris away from the surface, and it's unlikely to cause melting like that would, that would form the glass in the Libyan desert. But when I, made one little change to the simulation and I had the explosion move downward with a lot of momentum, it carried all that energy down to the surface. And that was really kind of the epiphany. Um, when I saw that simulation of comparing the nuclear explosion type air burst moving upward and the asteroid type air burst very turbulently moving downward and melting the surface like a blow, a blow torch, that's what convinced me that that formed the Libyan desert glass. And I think it was really the scientific visualization that allowed me to really understand it at an intuitive level and allowed me to explain it to other people in a way that convinced them as well. Great, great. Ron, I wanted to kind of uh, piggyback on that uh, idea of uh, extracting the science from a visualization to this whole idea of collisional families, because I, I think what you're doing is really interesting in terms of, uh, it, it's almost like you're a detective trying to reconstruct the scene of the crime. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've been able to learn about cosmic origins perhaps, or, or uh, the way that the solar system is put together based on, on your work. 
Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, one of the great things about being involved with both the OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa 2 missions is that um, although I'm not an observer myself, uh, the people I talk to like uh, Daniela have given us theorists some great constraints uh, for our simulations. Um, that's almost instantaneous. Typically a theorist would have to wait years for new results to come by with which we can constrain our simulations. Um, but because we're embedded in the mission, we get almost you know, instantaneous feedback on what we're doing right and wrong. Uh, so for example, one of the you know, cool things that uh, Danny's able to do with the team is give us some really good idea of the brightness variation on the surface, what individual boulders, uh, what their properties are. And so what we can do is use that information and basically see what initial conditions would uh, it, from our supercomputer simulations would reproduce those properties of these asteroids. And because computational power has been increasing at an exponential rate, we can simulate uh, smaller and smaller sizes. Um, and that allows us to really be able to match this fantastic data that we're, be, we're, we're getting back from the mission. So like you said, yeah, it's really detective work. It's really piecing together all these hints and these space missions are just giving theorists like myself, um, a great wealth of clues from which we can uh, basically look back at the beginning of the origins of these two small asteroids and say, okay, what was the impact angle? Uh, what was the energy involved? How many other, uh, I guess, siblings of daughter uh, of, of Yugu and Bennu are there out there uh, that could potentially also be part of the same asteroid family that we can't see now because they're either too small or too faint. Great. And that brings me to you, Yoon, because uh, even though Oumuamua was the first interstellar asteroid, it, it's not going to be the last. In fact, there, there was another interstellar object that, that uh, came through uh, recently, and, and people think that there are going to be more of these. Uh, how do you expect uh, data visualizations to affect our understanding of, of these weird and mysterious objects? Yeah. There is a second interstellar object that is, looks very different from the first one. Oumuamua is more like, similar to an asteroid, and the second one is more like a comet, which have a lot of outgassing and dust. So uh, at this will bring us back to how they be ejected from the, their home planet system in the first place. These comments, they usually have a larger distance to their host star, so they are less bound and can be easily get, get ejected from the host star. But for asteroids, it's another different story. So we need to get, the, uh, get from the observations information, then to deduce how they can get rid of the asteroid from the Earth planetary system. So like for example, for Oumuamuma, it's elongated shape and also its surface color, things like it has a red surface color, which means it may come close to its home system's host star. So in this case, we can trace back to its formation theory by like it's come very close to its host star and then be disrupted by the star's tidal force and then escaped from that system. And we use supercomputer simulation, we, compare, we visualize our result and compare their similarity between the product and Oumuamuma. And then we can make all the connection to find out what's the cause for the formation of Oumuamuma and possibly we will find out more this Oumuamua-like interstellar object in the future, which is very exciting. Yes, that, I'm going to look forward to that. And I'm also going to look forward to what's coming from OSIRIS-REx. Daniela, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you expect when it comes to coming attractions in the asteroid world. Uh, so in the next uh, couple months, OSIRIS-REx is preparing to uh, sample asteroid Bennu. And the way we are sampling the asteroid um, is through a touch and go maneuver, uh, which we have dubbed TAG. 
Um, and so in October of this year, we'll be uh, touching down on the surface of venue tagging. And uh, we are only in contact with Venue for a brief couple seconds. Um, and during those, those few seconds, our sampling mechanism is going to agitate the surface of the asteroid and pick up some uh, rocky material and then back away um, and get to a safe distance from the surface of Venue so we can verify whether or not we've collected anything. Um, so we're really excited. We have been studying this asteroid um, for a year and a half and we're still going to study it a little further uh, and all that effort has uh, allowed us to identify the best place on Bennu from which to gather a sample and so uh, everybody keep your eye out for October of 2020 um, when we tag. Well this has been a fantastic 20 minutes I really appreciate uh, all the expertise and all the I'm, I'm already visualing, visualizing asteroids better than I did when we started. So uh, I really want to thank you for that. And I want to thank the organizers of Asteroid Day 2020 for providing this opportunity for people to get an idea of what, what all this looks like and what, what great work you're all doing. So uh, thank you so much to all our panelists and uh, look forward to more on the Asteroid Day 2020 schedule. So for Asteroid Day 2020, I'm Alan Boyle telling you to watch the skies. <laughs>